Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. Part 1 You are going to hear a conversation about purchasing a cellular phone. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 1 to 6. Excuse me, can you give me some information about purchasing a cellular phone? Of course, my pleasure. We carry all sorts of phones, from the most basic phones to very sophisticated web-enabled phones. I will do my best to help you find a phone that suits your needs. Thanks. I'm looking for two cellular phones, one for me and one for my son. I think I won't need anything too sophisticated. Just your basic phone functions. But maybe my son will like something with more functions. Sure, well, let's take a look. So you have no preferences at all? What about the size or colour? How about the brand? Well, I don't really care what brand the cell phone is, but I guess I don't want anything that's too big or too small. I want a phone that can fit nicely in my hand and in my pocket. If it's too big, it might be too heavy, and if it's too small, I might lose it. Colour, I don't really care about either. Well, I don't want a pink phone. Ah, OK. So, let's look for something suitable for a working person. How about this one? This one is the R55. It is black. Not too big, not too small. All the usual functions. The best feature of the R55 is that it can be used worldwide, even in Europe or Asia. It looks good. How much does it cost? It is only $100. If you sign up for a calling plan, then we will give you a $50 discount on the phone. How old is this model, though? I don't want anything that's too old. This model was introduced into the market about three years ago, so it is a bit older, but be assured it will still work fine. Well, I think I still want something not as old. How about from last year? Any good phones from around that time? Yes, there are some. How about this one? It's the new model of the phone you just looked at, called the W55. Most of the features are the same. There are some new features on the W55, though. The battery will last up to two days longer, and the overall weight of the phone is lighter. How much is this one? This is selling for $150. If you purchase it along with a phone plan, then it will be only $100. OK, I think I'll take this one. Now, I need to pick up a phone for my son. I think he'll want something more trendy, so how about a new model for him? Nothing too extravagant or expensive, though. This right here is the newest offering from the leading company in the cellular phone business. The phone is called the Rocket. It is well suited for teenage users. Among the teen-friendly features are 10 songs to choose from, a free messaging system that allows friends to send texts to each other, and voice recognition dialing. The thing most younger users like about the Rocket is that it has a screen that changes colours. All this for only $100 with a purchase of a one-year phone plan. Sounds like something my son will like. Can I sign us both up at once? Yes, of course. Both of you can share one plan. You will pay only $50 a month for both of you to share a plan. That's it? Only $50 a month? Yes, that's all. Now look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 7 to 10. OK. I will need your information. Name and address, please. Richard Derek Jones. What's your profession? I'm an engineer. Address, please. 322 First Street, San Francisco, California. And phone number, please. 621-360-7600. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong number. 
621-360-7610. How many phones do you want activated onto your plan? Two for now. Thank you very much. Your phones will be ready in a minute. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days will be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit, between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass, like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. 
Now, the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toadstools. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So, having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, what was it like in your school then, Lynn? Well, South African schools are very different from schools in Australia. For a start, children don't start their schooling until they are seven, quite a bit later than schools in Australia. What about New Zealand, Gail? We're more like Australia. I can't believe children don't go to school until they are seven. When do the parents get any free time? Well, there's still the availability of kindergartens or play schools. It's just that formal education doesn't start until later. I don't think it's such a good idea for children to have to be too academic at such a young age. They should be able to just enjoy themselves. Well, yeah, but the first school children go to isn't really very academic. It's just an opportunity for children to learn a few basic social skills by playing and learning with other children. Yes, I'd agree with that. I guess being so close, Australian and New Zealand schools must be similar then. Well, I suppose they do share a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. For example, children in New Zealand go through intermediate school, but in Australia there's only high school. That's right, isn't it, Pat? Yeah, I think so. 
What about South Africa, Lynn? Do you have an intermediate or high school? Oh, high school. And now the difference between Australian and New Zealand education is that although both countries have state schools and private schools, our private schools are very often run by religious groups, whereas New Zealand schools are secular. That's not true. There are quite a few religious schools in New Zealand. Oh, OK. Maybe we are similar. Only a few South African schools have any religious connection, so I guess we're different. Most people go to state schools. Pat, is it true that some people from your country don't have to go to school at all? Well, that's partly true. Because of the geography of Australia, there are a lot of children who do not have access to schools, at least on a regular basis. Instead, they have a form of correspondence education, where the lessons are actually on the radio and the students send their work in by post. That way they get a lot of what they would if they were in the classroom, apart from the interaction. In New Zealand, not all students have to go to school either. Some parents have opted for homeschooling. Oh, is that like correspondence teaching? We don't really have that. Well, we do have correspondence schools, but homeschooling is different. With homeschooling, the parents teach the children and set them homework. They have to present a syllabus to their local education authority before they can do that, but it is becoming a more popular choice for some parents. I suppose it also suits parents' own commitments. I mean, they don't have to worry about collecting their children from school, and they can always teach over the weekend or in the evening if they want to. Is the school day normally quite long, then? Not in New Zealand, but I think it can be in Australia. Yeah, that's right. I think Australia is unusual in that there are extracurricular activities which you have to go to. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. These are normally sport activities, but there are a few other options. We have activities after school for any student that is interested, but they aren't compulsory. What about in New Zealand, Gail? I had to do some sport every week. I didn't really like it, but it was part of the school day, so I guess that's not so bad. Anyway, I spent two years at boarding school, so things were a little different. Boarding school? What was that like? Well, the thing I remember most about it was the strict dress code. There were restrictions on everything. You had to wear a school uniform almost all of the time, and it had to be cleaned and ironed. The length of your skirt had to be no less than one inch above your knees when kneeling down. Sometimes we used to go out on school trips or just at weekends with a few friends, but whenever we were outside the school, we had to wear a hat. There was one teacher who always used to give me extra homework because my socks weren't pulled up, and that was in the school late in the evening. I suppose it wasn't that bad, but at the time it felt like a prison. I kept getting into trouble for something. Most of the time I forgot something, normally my school badge. We had to wear that all the time, in the school and out, because it had our house colours on it. Wow, that doesn't sound like much fun. No, but it was a good education, I suppose. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Going to hear a conversation between two students. They are talking about the English bars. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Kevin, could you tell me something about the bars? I have never been to a bar. You see, Steve, my classmate, has invited me to go to a bar tonight. I see. You know, the word bar means a room in a pub. We say the bar when we mean the part of that room where drinks are kept. Soon after you go into the pub, you'll realize that nobody comes to the tables to take orders or money. Instead, customers go to the bar to buy their drinks. I see. People will go to the bar directly to get their drinks and don't wait for someone to come to take their orders. That's right. People don't queue at the bar, but they do wait till it's their turn. Oh, how do I pay? I mean, do I pay directly after I get the drink, or do I have to wait till I'm ready to leave like I do in a restaurant? It's not the custom to pay for all your drinks when you're ready to leave. Instead, you pay at the bar each time you get drinks. It helps if you're ready to pay as soon as you're served, and you'll notice that many people wait with their money in their hands. I see. Do I have to give a tip? No. It's not the custom to give a tip. It's very common for friends to buy their drinks together in rounds. This means that each person takes a turn to buy drinks for everybody in the group. It's faster and easier, both for you and for the person serving, if drinks are bought in this way. Naturally, you don't have to have a drink in each round if you don't want one. That's interesting. When you're looking for somewhere to sit, Remember that people have to leave their seats to get drinks, etc. So an empty seat may not in fact be available to you. If you're not sure whether a seat is free, ask someone sitting near it. When it's time for another drink, people usually take their glasses back to the bar to be filled again. If you're leaving, the friendly thing to do is to take your glasses back to the bar, thank the person who's been serving you, and say goodbye or good night. Thank you, Kevin. This helps me a lot. By the way, what kinds of drinks are available in pubs? Well, you can get both alcoholic and non-alcoholic. Beside alcoholic drinks, such as beer and wine, there is cider, which is made from apples, usually sold in bottles, port, a type of thick sweet wine from Portugal, sherry, which is a type of wine from Spain, and spirits. These are a kind of strong, alcoholic drinks such as whiskey and brandy. What about non-alcoholic? I don't drink alcohol. Well, they offer all kinds of fruit juices, such as orange and tomato. These drinks are usually sold in small bottles. And soft drinks, we often call sweet drinks, like Coke and Fanta. They are normally sold in small bottles or cans and lemonade, which is a clear and sweet drink made with carbonated water. They also serve cordials. What are cordials? Cordials are strong and sweet drinks tasting of fruit, such as lime cordial, black currant cordial. They are often added to other drinks or drunk with water. I don't like sweet drinks. Are there any other non-alcoholic drinks? Yes, mineral water, but it's not available in all pubs. Kevin, one more question. What is VAT? I saw this on most goods in Britain. Well, VAT stands for Value Added Tax. The price shown on most goods in Britain includes a tax of 15%. If you use the retail export scheme, this tax can be returned to you if you take the goods with you when you leave Britain. You may have to spend a certain sum of money before you qualify for the scheme, and you'll have to show your passport. Ask in the shop if they operate the retail export scheme. If they do, the shop assistant will explain how you can get the tax back and fill in a form with you. VAT is also charged on hotel, restaurant bills, theater, cinema tickets, and car hire. Are these refundable? No. It's not refundable in these cases. Thank you very much. I really learned a lot. That is the end. That is the end of section four.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.